Hi everyone, I'm Chuck McLennan for Buick Know How. Today, we're going to cover Class 2. We'll see how Class 2 really works, and we'll show you precisely what to do to fix Class 2 concerns on Park Avenues. You know, there's so much mystery surrounding Class 2. Is it complicated and misunderstood? Yes. And that's exactly why you're seeing this program. So clear the decks. We're going to lay Class 2 out for all to see. You know, we recently received email from a technician saying that he had to know how a system should work before he could find out why it wouldn't. And that's our purpose today. To do this, we'll need the help of the lead electrical engineer for the 97 and 98 Park Avenue. I'm talking about Mr. Stan Majeski. Hi, Stan. Welcome back to Buick Know How. Hi, Chuck. Good to be back. Have a seat. Thanks. Stan, what's the best way to start talking about Class 2? Well, Chuck, let's review something that's familiar like UART. Well, now, how will an overview of UART help us understand Class 2? Well, UART's been in the field for a number of years, and most of the service technicians are now familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And then what would be the similarities between UART and Class 2, do you think? Well, Chuck, the biggest, the biggest similarity is they're both communication buses, and they both allow modules to share information. So what are their differences, then? Well, this is where we're going to need to review how UART works first, and then we'll get into how Class 2 works. Sure. Will this teach us the, um, well, the learn to walk before you learn to run idea? Exactly. We need to understand how the communication bus that's out there, UART, actually works, and then that'll allow us to walk into Class 2 and understand how the new system is working. Stan, what does a master controller do? Well, the master controller regulates all bus communications. And what happens after a module replies to a master controller? Well, the module continues its normal processing. Basically goes on doing what it was doing before, before it was asked for information. Does it just reply and then do something? Or does it actually have to wait for another message? Well, the only time it would wait for, for the next message or a response would be if it needed that information to continue processing. The Park Avenue doesn't really have a UART system. Stan, could you explain the other forms of UART that the car does have? Well, the Park Avenue actually has three buses. It has a Class 2 bus, it has a ENC bus, and it has a simple bus. Uh, we'll talk about Class 2 a little later. But ENC is used for communication between the HVAC, the CD changer, and the radio. And then the simple bus is used for communication between the doors. How does Class 2 know what to do without a master of the bus? Well, Chuck, the way to look at it is, on class, in Class 2, all the modules are really a master. And, and they talk peer to peer. So they're all at the same level. Stan, could you explain functional messaging for us? Uh, Chuck, first thing we need to do is, is understand there's two, two types of messages on the car. There's a functional message and a physical message. Uh, with the functional message, that's the message you're going to see 99% of the time on the car. Uh, driving down the road, that's the messaging that's going on. Uh, the only time you're going to see a physical message is when you get into a dealership, uh, plug in the Tech 2, and start diagnosing modules. Uh, that's, that's the type of messaging that, messaging that takes place. The 1998 Park Avenue has 10 Class 2 modules. These include driver door module, pass key 3 module, electronic brake controller, powertrain control module, optional memory seat module, instrument cluster, sensing diagnostic module, heater and AC programmer, standard body module, and the remote function actuator. Stan, how fast is Class 2? Class 2 runs at 10.4 uh, kilobits per second, as opposed to the UART where we ran at uh, 8192 bits per second. There's not that much differencing in speed of the buses. It's, it's how the messages are used and how the different modules talk to each other. Can you check Class 2 with a meter or the Tech 2? Uh, yes, you can. Actually, both. Uh, first thing you want to do with the meter, uh, you want to plug the meter in between the Class 2 bus or the Class 2 line, however you want to address it, and ground. And you should see the voltmeter move between 0 and 7 volts. Uh, you really don't want to see the meter pegged. Uh, if it's pegged either end, uh, you probably have some type of Class 2 wiring problem. Uh, with the Tech 2, 
you can plug it in and you should see the note alive for each of the boxes like we talked. Stan, since there isn't really a master controller, how is class two managed? Well, Chuck, class two is managed by power modes. Stan, how many power modes are there? Well, on the, on the Park Avenue, there's seven power modes, and they are run, accessory, unlock, wrap, which is retained accessory power, crank, off awake, and off asleep. And what does each power mode do? Well, now you're going to get complicated. Uh, run, you've got to picture it, key is in run position, and that's when most of the initialization and in, in normal operation of the car is. So a lot happens in run. Then you have accessory, where keys turn back, you're an accessory, and only a certain boxes are up. You'd have like the door modules would be awake, uh, the radio, uh, the retained accessory power module, the, the rack module, uh, and that's about it. Uh, with unlock, which would be the next power mode, uh, you just have two boxes awake. That would be the theft module and the PCM, and that's for communication of the password for the key. Uh, wrap is exactly the same as accessory, retained accessory power. And then you have crank, starting the car, where most modules are not awake during crank. Uh, you'd only have the PCM awake and the theft module. Uh, then you have off, off awake, which is basically walking up to the car, hitting the key fob. Part of the car wakes up to see what's going on, doors unlock, uh, things like that. And then you have off asleep, which is pretty much half the car's life when the car is not being used. The car is asleep, there's no bus activity at all. Stan, does every module initialize whenever a power mode changes? Uh, yes, it does. But what you need to know is that every time you change key position, which changes power mode, you reinitialize. Everything starts all over again. So as you're taking codes and and, and uh, diagnosing the car, just a simple key transition can change the codes that are there. Basically, what is in every message then? Well, Chuck, every message contains a header and then a data byte. How do the modules actually know if the message is not for them? Well, the message header contains enough information so that the module that receives, that's receiving the message can determine if that's data they need or not. What does a module do to get information from the bus? The modules read the messages into the receive buffer. In other words, every message that's sent out on the bus, every module reads it. And they read it in to the receive buffer. And once they determine if it's data they want, they use that data. It's like this. Hey, I just found out that the outside air temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I need to tell someone. I don't care about air temperature. I don't care about air temperature. Hey, I do. It's 90 degrees out there. I have a whole list of things to do once I know the air temperature. Hey, it's 90 degrees. Yeah, I heard. Then how does a module get rid of old messages? Well, the module would just clear the buffer like we talked about earlier. It's reading it into this buffer. Once it determines that it's not a good message or it's not data that it needs, it just clears it. Stan, why don't messages contain destination information? Well, the information is for any module that can use it. Okay, it's put on the bus, and if you need that piece of information like we talked earlier, you're out for yourself. You're out there trying to get the data you need. Uh, example would be uh, outside air temperature. Uh, the HCM, heater control module, reads the sensor and then puts the information on the bus. And anybody else that needs it, they go out there, they pick up the information, they use it. Could you explain physical messaging to us? Yeah, physical messaging is what you'd use in a dealership with a Tech 2. Uh, this is where you're requesting a specific action from a module. Uh, example would be you're, you're getting codes or trying to override or do something to a module. You're talking to one module specifically. You're not trying to talk to all of them at once. Now, you said earlier that functional messages are what we see 99% of the time. Uh, let's cover those in more detail. Sure. Stan, what's a learned message? Well, with functional messages, what you have is you, you don't know who the destination is. So you're sending the information out there, 
and whoever needs the information is receiving it. And if I need a piece of information, I want to know who's sending it to me. So once I receive that piece of information, I learn who's sending it to me. Uh, example would be the uh, HCM example. I, HCM sends out outside air temperature on the bus. The PCM wants that piece of information. Once it receives it the first time, it learns who's sending it. So now it knows who's giving it the information. Stan, what's a state of health message? A state of health message is how a module keeps track of the other modules on the bus. And why are these messages so important? Well, this is how a module determines if the information it's currently using is valid or not. Uh, example would be uh, the outside air temperature uh, and the PCM. The PCM is using the information that it currently has. Uh, the HCM would only send the outside air temperature back out on the bus if there's a change in the outside air temperature. Uh, the PCM doesn't know if the, va if the data it's working on is valid or not. So it's keeping track of the state of health of the HCM to make sure it's out there talking. So it would never know if it fell off the bus, let's say, and that the old data it was using is invalid. Modules send a message to the bus every two seconds to say, I'm here, I'm operational. Are there differences between the codes that a car can set? Yes, on uh, Park Avenue, we can actually set four types of codes. Uh, we can set the P code, PCM code, C code, which is chassis code, uh, B code, body code, and a U code. So what is a U code exactly? Well, the U code is a communication code. Uh, it's set once a module is established communication, and then that communication is somehow lost. Uh, example would be, back to our PCM, uh, PCM is receiving air temperature from the HCM, and for some reason the HCM stops communicating. The PCM would set a code for the HCM that it has gone. Are modules getting replaced because of U-code misunderstandings? Yes, uh, U-codes are a little different than the normal hard codes, and I think that's where the technicians are getting caught up and getting confused. How would a technician shift his or her thinking to better understand U-codes? Well, U-codes point to the devices that are having the problem. Typically, the module that has the code is not the module that has the problem. Uh, generally, it's, it's not a module that's failing, it's, it's, it's usually something else. The modules on the Park Avenues, uh, 97, 98 Park Avenues, they're pretty reliable. It's usually other things. Stan, if modules hardly ever fail, then what does? I found that most cases where you've had a lot of U-code set, uh, it's a wiring problem, maybe a loose ground, blown fuse or intermittent type connection, car being jump-started, low battery, things like that will set U-codes. So we're just dealing with basic automotive electrical repairs, right? Correct. Uh, rarely in the modules do you see these problems. Uh, I've diagnosed probably 200 plus cases uh, with the technicians out in the field. And typically when you have a lot of U-code set on a car, it's a power, a ground, a wiring, uh, maybe low battery type condition that's setting these codes and confusing the issue. Stan, what's the best way to diagnose class two concerns? Well, what, what we've been using is a four-step approach. Uh, I found the best way to do it is, first thing you do when you walk up to the car is, plug in the tech to record every code that's out there. Then go in, clear all the codes. Get rid of the noise from, I mean, low battery, plugging in your fax machine, your car phone, things like that. Drive the vehicle and then re-plug in the tech to and record the other the codes that are left. So how do you know which codes are noise and which aren't? Well the ones that are reset are the ones where I would start. Okay, start diagnosing those, making sure that you get to the bottom of those codes first. Once those codes are gone, you, you're, you're through your initial debug. You can start getting into any of the heavier stuff that you might have to do and fix on the car. I'm sure we all understand that if a U-code resets, a module still can't talk, but uh, how do you isolate that further? Well, I would start by checking the power, the grounds, connectors, connections to the module, and the overall bus integrity. Look at the message monitor. If a module isn't there, it's fallen off the bus. Remember, modules that set U-codes tell you the identity 
of the quiet module. Disconnect its connector with the digital voltmeter. Check the power in the ground at the terminals in the connector. It is important to test the power and ground circuits that the module actually uses. If you don't get voltage, trace the power circuit until you find the short or open. Perform any necessary basic electrical repairs to restore power and or ground to the module. So power and grounds and then see if the bus is okay. Exactly. So then most uh, often the cause is lack of power and ground. Is, it's that simple? Exactly. Well, so when do you know that you're finished with the repair? Well, the bottom line is once the modules are not resetting the codes and you've found an actual problem, uh, typically you'll find a loose connector, backed out terminal maybe, uh, blown fuse, loose ground, then, then you're done. Car is done. There you have it, Chuck. Stan, I can't thank you enough. Everybody involved with Buick Know How really appreciates you stopping by. Thanks. Thank have you. Have a good day. Bye bye. I want to end this program by saying that the Know How website is a great success. Technicians are hitting the site by the hundreds every day. We've responded to your input by updating the system and adding hyperlinks whenever possible. For example, one of the Buick best technicians emailed us and let us know about a GM calibration site, so that's accessible too. We've seen all sorts of suggestions on the message board, and some have been very good. You've turned out to be a lot more tuned in to the internet than we originally anticipated. And from the comments we've heard, we know that Buick know-how is headed in the right direction. To date, the site had a one-day high of 1,000 page hits. Hits are averaging about 400 per day, with a huge spike just after the release of the engine mechanical program. Most activity occurs between 9 and 11 p.m., though we do get plenty of activity throughout the day. So, if you think you're the only one out there using the site, you're not. Everyone is very happy about the response, and we plan to make continual improvements. We'll keep you posted. Oh, and don't forget, you can take the quiz for this program online. So log on and tell us what you think.